luck to be working uh, in, the, in the Arctic areas uh, in Greenland and in the, in the Northern of Sweden. So uh, my life is very much uh, working with historic buildings and uh, the scope that I'd like to, um, to introduce is that we've been talking a lot about the energy consumption of historic buildings in this, uh, in this conference here. Uh, and that is an important part and one of the largest uh, carbon footprints you have on historic houses uh, as it is. But um, on top of that, uh, there is also this discussion about the construction and maintenance of historic houses. Uh, that is uh, about one third of the energy consumption that you actually have in a, in a historic house. This energy used for the materials we do need for maintenance, for remodeling, for new buildings in historic context, and so on. Uh, I think that there is a very, very big um, possibility uh, to play a part in reducing the carbon footprint when we uh, apply a couple of really, really simple strategies when we uh, address these uh, construction and maintenance uh, assignments. But also, uh, as the whole uh, concept of this Congress is that we have to play our part. Actually, historic houses, they should play a larger part they are built in a time where energy was uh, very uh, very hard to get to, uh, and also they're built on a tradition. Uh, and the, and the, um, both the construction materials uh, and the construction techniques used in historic buildings, they have a uh, lot to play in the new world we have to, to look into when building uh, new houses that doesn't use as much energy as they do today. <coughs> From uh, the uh, EC Parliament, um, right now uh, construction in the, Euro, uh, in the European Union they use about 50% of all extracted the materials. Um, they contribute to 35% of all the waste uh, that we produce in the European Union, and they uh, stand for about 8 to 12% of the greenhouse gas emissions that we look into. So uh, these numbers tell us that there is a huge potential uh, for doing something quite much better. Uh, the European Union itself has come up with the number 80% uh, that they think is the potential for reducing uh, the carbon footprint of, of uh, construction and maintenance. Uh, I have no idea how they got to that number, but uh, uh, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound like uh, <laughs> yes, 70 or 80%, then uh, 80% was the right one. But actually, uh, when you look at the other numbers and say that 35% of the waste in the European Union come from construction and maintenance. Uh, that number should actually be zero. Uh, so there should be some kind of potential. If they say that, I don't know, but uh, at least it has to be quite a big one. In our projects, uh, we work very, very closely with, uh, with the waste that we produce, and uh, we think a lot about the materials that we use. And with a uh, very uncertain um, scientific um, uh, way to look at it, uh, I can see that beforehand, when we didn't uh, put the same energy in, counting how much waste we had. Uh, when I looked at that, the waste came out of the, the building projects we, we were running. Uh, almost half of the waste coming out was new materials that hadn't been used in the, in the, in the renovation. It's like uh, materials that uh, you ordered too much materials, materials that got too old, uh, materials that was uh, destroyed by war or something else because it wasn't treated uh, properly at the building site, and all that sort of materials. Um, we use a lot now, uh, we use LCA for instance uh, as a tool to uh, measure all the materials that come into the building site and all the materials that come out of the building site. And actually, uh, my not say LCA? that... Sorry, what is LCA? LCA is carbon... Uh, life cycle analysis. Life cycle analysis, yes. It's uh, when we look at all the materials, we look at the carbon footprint of them, uh, and then you calculate what is the total carbon footprint of what we're doing and take decisions on that, uh, on that uh, level. Uh, and starting to do that and uh, making all the contractors quite uh, thoroughly uh, count what uh, materials are coming into the building side and what materials are coming out of it uh, and what are the materials coming out of it. 
this is the force, for instance, that we have to uh, to, to uh, renew, uh, or is it uh, waste materials that shouldn't have been uh, on the building site in the first place uh, because it's not going to be used? So uh, by doing that, you can actually reduce that number to about five to ten percent or something like that. It's quite enormous how much just looking at the waste in numbers uh, makes people act differently. Um, there is a lot of different uh, ways to look at how to build more um, build more uh, carbon effective. Um, I think that at least I talk about historic buildings. Uh, if we use these four uh, strategies, uh, we get a long way. First of all, um, as an owner of an historic house, we know that these houses are built to stand for a very, very long time. Um, and to look at this when we design uh, both maintenance but also when we design remodeling and new buildings, uh, longevity of the materials and the constructions and the plans of what we're doing, uh, thinking about that they have to be able to adjust for different times. They're not just made in our time, but they have to adjust for times uh, ahead. This is a really, really important way uh, to look at it. To look at rep uh, repairability um, as well. Um, that we don't need to uh, change a uh, window just because the lifespan of this window has uh, expired, but we can repair that window instead, for instance. Um, right now in the EU, we talk a lot about repairability of electronics, but for some reason, we're not talking about it in the, in the sense of our buildings. Then, of course, reuse, that is something everybody's talking about. Uh, and then, sustainable disposal, uh, as the last one of them, uh, is something that should be addressed. I'll try to take a couple of examples uh, of each of these strategies uh, just to show how to, to work with them. I think often just to have them as strategies is a lot easier way to address them than to uh, make a full uh, life circle analysis or uh, create to cradle concepts or something like that. That is quite complicated. Um, yes, we go back to, to the historic buildings as a, as a as an object. Uh, this example is also from, from Jutland. It's a, it's a limestone uh, work uh, when you, uh, you <coughs> eat limestone to make, um, make more. Um, it's an example of the way that uh, energy was seen in, before the second uh, industrial revolution. At that time, energy was a very, very uh, limited resource. So all the techniques and all the materials used they were designed and uh, uh, they have come from, from a world that doesn't, didn't have that much energy. Uh, before we had coal, before we had petroleum, uh, uh, energy was very, very hard to get at. So all of these techniques uh, we can, um, they're inspired by uh, the historic buildings and use them in, in the new context. Also, the construction um, in the old days they were made from tradition and not as much as uh, planning as they are today. You're doing the same thing over and over again, and slowly uh, this uh, repeating concept, we're building it from the Middle Ages until uh, the late 1800s. Uh, we really, this is the same house we're building again and again. Uh, we're doing small changes all the time um, so that we're introducing new techniques, uh, and all the techniques that didn't work, they're slowly phased out of it. <laughs> so also uh, these um, these techniques that are used here uh, are have proven over time to be solid techniques that can be repeated again and again and get a good result. Uh, just to show you how hard it was, uh, I know that uh, the industrial revolution in England uh, uh, was sort of mainly driven by coal, but in the Nordic countries it was driven by by wood. Um, so you're able to make limestone, you had to cut down wood and transport it. To the, to the motor work, um, the, the motor plant, uh, that was done by hand like this. Uh, my colleague earlier told us about how much uh, forest we had in Denmark before we started to heat down houses and uh, limestone production was really a big big thing in Denmark. And uh, within about 50 years, or maybe 70 years, we cut down almost all our forests. And after that, there was really, really a uh, limited resource and you had to uh, really make the most of every wood you cut down. 
Uh, right now we're working on this uh, beautiful house in uh, the middle of Copenhagen, in the, in the, in the garden of the, the Copenhagen University. Uh, and in this house uh, we're really working with uh, going back to techniques for, for um, outdoor painting uh, that was uh, used uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Some of you, especially those of you who has a house in the Eastern Europe, part, uh, in the Eastern Europe they're probably still uh, seeing that uh, some of the old paint on the house is almost impossible to get off. Uh, that's because of, uh, at least in Eastern Europe, uh, traditional oil paints was used up to about the 1960s or 1970s. So much of those paints uh, still exist, and you can see that sometimes when we try to, to, uh, to repaint the window or something like that, that uh, some paints are almost impossible. He keeps uh, living maybe 30, 40, 50 years after it was painted. Uh, we all know that and seen that, and then the problem is that one paint, uh, especially the plastic paints, we they need to repaint the windows every five or seven years. It's really, really a bad product, seen in that way. And at the same time, uh, we see that the plastic paints are contributing to about 55% of the, the microplastic uh, in the ocean. So something has to be done about this. Um, and with the knowledge we have from the old houses, we can see that the old paint was really, really much better than this. And we are working with a Swedish, uh, a Swedish, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, research, uh, yes, uh, researcher uh, who has been re uh, creating uh, traditional oil paint from uh, before the 1900s. Um, and we're working with that on this uh, building. Uh, she has. Uh, been researching in this field for about 30 years or something like that. But we have really, really good results from some of our other, other uh, experiments. So actually, we're going back to an oil paint that was uh, heated uh, quite extensively uh, with a little bit of lead in it. And uh, that's a discussion for itself. But there is a little bit of lead in it. Um, that really gives this extremely uh, hard surface uh, to the paint and keeps on living uh, really long. Uh, the oil paint we're using here has a lifespan of about 20 to 30 years between uh, repainting and so that intervals. Um, and we expect to see that uh, maybe even more than 30 years. Of course, it has a very long uh, history in this project. We uh, probably won't see the result until yeah, 30 years from now. Um, let's see here, we are in quite a work on it. Um, the next one is uh, repairability, uh, the way to, to design products uh, and uh, techniques that is actually possible to repair. Um, I took this example of it, it's uh, another project from Greenland uh, where we use, uh, we use tar uh, as, uh, as a uh, basic uh, the treatment on the outside, both for the roofs and for the facades. A treatment that is possible to renew once in a while, it's really easy to renew it. Uh, it takes about two days or something like that to, to retard this house. Uh, it has to be done about every two, three years or something like that. Uh, but it's a quite an easy way to, 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 to do maintenance on the house. Uh, instead of putting up uh, these, uh, these maintenance-free uh, solutions that is impossible to, to maintenance on. Also, we all know, uh, probably at least in list buildings, we don't use modern windows. Uh, but really, modern windows have a lifespan of about 20 to 30 years or something like that. And that is that you have to replace the whole window. Uh, it's impossible to repair it. So, uh, thinking about that is really uh, an important concept. And also, learning from the old houses uh, how to, to build things where these parts of the house, in this case, the sockle here, uh, that is the, the part of the wood that is going to be rotting uh, after a couple of years. Uh, think about that. Uh, pieces like this where uh, where uh, it has to be replaced at some point and it's done in a way that it, has, it can be replaced instead of replacing the whole facade. Um, then we're going to talk about reuse uh, and my example of the reuse uh, concept is from, uh, from a Danish company called the Garten Wolfgang, old the brick stones. Uh, that's a, 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 a solution for uh, removing uh, Removing mortars from old brick stones. Uh, they have a production of about 45 million stones a year now. So it's quite a big uh, production uh, they have. 
where uh, older stoves are first uh, treated in a microwave and then uh, a chip uh, to get off this, uh, this uh, old mortar. And of course, to be able to do this, the mortar has to be uh, lime mortar. You can't use cement mortar because it can get off. And my concept here is, again, to think about reduce the second you make this wall. If this wall is uh, made with lime mortars, uh, the stone can be reused in 100 years, 200 years. If it's done with the cement mortar, that is not a possibility. So uh, I think we have the obligation to, uh, to have this extreme long lifespan and the view of things. So we think about reuse also in the, in the construction uh, that we plan. Uh, yes, and we use a lot of these stoves for, for different projects. Uh, use stoves, they uh, save us about almost two-thirds of the carbon footprint uh, of the stove used. So um, it's a really uh, effective way of reducing the uh, carbon footprint. And the last thing uh, I was to talk about is uh, sustainable um, disposal of the materials. Uh, we actually find lucky that most of the materials we use in historic buildings, both the materials that we used originally, but also the materials that we hopefully use, uh, use in the future, is uh, either natural materials or uh, bioheat materials uh, that can be um, disposed in a, in a, in a sensible way. Um, because there's a lot of talk in the, the industry right now about that you can uh, dismantle things, that, that it can be put at the chair, for instance. You can, you can take off the legs, and then you can take off the armchair, and stuff like that. And then you can reuse the different parts. It's an extremely complicated process. And I don't know, but I, I often ask myself if somebody actually is going to do that, uh, taking a part and reuse different products. But at least uh, thinking about doing something in a way that it can be disposed in a, in a sustainable manner without having to, to take it off uh, part by part uh, in, a, in a very complex and in a made over the course. Uh, we can see here example from uh, from my home, some sweet uh, warehouses slowly uh, going back to nature. Uh, and it's doing it all by itself. It doesn't need something to, to take out the different parts. Uh, and it's really curious for now. It's, it's not going to be a house anymore. Uh, and I'll end up with a different example from, from Morocco where houses are built with the clay and the sand on And when you leave the house, it goes back to nature. And I think this is a very good example of the kind of thinking that we should apply in construction and makes it so much.